on uh, cloning a gene, one of the things that you typically do when you clone a gene is to get its DNA sequence because once you found its DNA sequence, you could figure out what its exact amino acid sequence is because you get the amino acid sequence from the DNA. You could, by looking at its promoter and enhancers, you can figure out a little bit about the regulation of the gene. You could figure out alternative splicing by looking at its exon intron pattern and things like that. All that is you get by sequencing your, your gene of interest. So here's your gene of interest cloned into your plasmid. Now you don't want to sequence the whole plasmid because that's bacterial genes anyway, you're not interested in those. Um, and plus, the people who design these plasmids already have that sequence. Uh, but you know, this is the sequence you're interested in. And so this is one of the reasons why we want a restriction map, because if we find out that there's a restriction enzyme that cuts there and cuts there, then you could just chop out the bit you're interested in sequencing and save yourself the hassle of, of um, sequencing the bit that you're not interested in. So let's imagine that you, you did a restriction map and you found out that by cutting with this restriction enzyme and this restriction enzyme, you could get out that chunk like that. So there's your gene of interest and you want to sequence it. All right. Um, all right, typically the first thing you do before sequencing is boil it. Uh, and uh, boiling denatures DNA which in the context of DNA means separates the two strands. So you'll convert your double-stranded double DNA into a single-stranded DNA. Now here I'm just gonna draw one of the strands. Um, and we're only gonna get the sequence from one of the strands, but that's okay because if you have the sequence of one strand, you know the sequence of the other strand. Let's just say that one of the strands has a sequence like this. T, G, A, A, and I'm just making this up, you know, C, C, G, C, A, T, like that. Now, we don't know that yet, but that's, that's one of our strands. We don't know what its sequence is. All right, um, well, what we're gonna be doing is adding some DNA polymerase enzyme here in a moment. What does DNA polymerase do <coughs> to single-stranded DNA? DNA polymerase. If you give DNA polymerase enzyme a single strand of piece of DNA, what does it do to it? It does not transcribe. It does not transcribe would mean to make an mRNA for, out of it, but you're on the right track. It makes the complementary strand, right? So the DNA polymerase enzyme, once it has this piece of DNA, would make the complementary strand in DNA, like an A, C, T, T, G, G, that sort of thing. Um, now DNA polymerase needs a primer, remember, to uh, get started. But that's okay because if we have a bit of the plasmid sequence, a little upstream of our gene, we know the plasmid sequence. The people who supply us the plasmid will give us that. So let's say that the, the plasmid sequence, just to make this up, I'm gonna use lowercase letters here. Let's say that's part of the plasmid sequence there. Well, I can buy a primer that's complementary to that. Uh, uh, like that. So I'm saying that it, it's pretty easy to find a primer uh, to start your, your sequencing reaction because you know a little bit of the plasmid uh, sequence upstream of your gene. All right, so here's our primer. Now, uh, you know, maybe I should be showing this. This is, uh, this is uh, from your notes. Uh, so you need, uh, you, the clone gene is boiled to denature the strands and you're gonna need some DNA polymerase enzyme to do this sequencing. And you need a primer that's, I said complementary to the start of the gene, but anywhere near the start of the gene will do, including a little bit of the plasmid sequence. But someplace you can get a primer uh, near the beginning of your gene. And of course, you're gonna need some DNA nucleotides, some Gs and As and Ts and Cs, so that the DNA polymerase enzyme can construct uh, the complementary strand. And here's where things begin to get interesting. Um, Let's see, let me imagine these are some nucleotides that we've mixed into our sequencing test tubes for the uh, DNA polymerase to, to utilize. Uh, remember the structure of, of, of normal nucleotides looks something like this. Normal nucleotides have a phosphate kind of as their tail. 
They have a ribo sugar as kind of their body. And they have an atrogenous base, a G and A or a T or a C there, sort of like the head of the dog. And normal nucleotides, if they're uh, deoxy ribonucleic acids, if they're DNA, they don't have an, a hydroxyl group there. But normal nucleotides do have a hydroxyl group there. That's called the three prime carbon. So both DNA and RNA do have the hydroxyl group there. Uh, again, just to reiterate, RNA nucleotides have an OH there, but DNA nucleotides don't. That's what makes them deoxy right in the play phase. Now, that, that three prime hydroxyl group is important because you might remember when DNA polymerase is linking nucleotides together to make a DNA strand, it uses this oxygen as, as a linkage site. If, that is, if we bring in the next nucleotide that's to be linked to this one, the phosphate comes in there, there's the ribose, there's the base, and that OH goes, that hydrogen goes away, but that oxygen becomes the linker between the two. And so the, the important point to remember here is that you really need that three prime OH group on a nucleotide to allow it to be linked to the next nucleotide. If that oxygen was missing, DNA polymerase could not add, in, add any more uh, nucleotides to that one. So uh, anyway, most of the nucleotides that you put in your DNA sequencing mixture are the good old normal type, like these guys here. But a few of them, a, a small percentage of them that you mix in your tube are what they sometimes call dideoxynucleotides. Now, uh, where did I put it? Uh, there we go. A small number of DNA nucleotides in your mixture are, are artificially modified. They're missing that three prime OH group. So these these dideoxy ones look like this. There's the ribose. There's the phosphate. Here's their nitrogenous base, their G or A or T or C, but they do not have that three prime OH group right there. It's been artificially removed. And so these guys can't be linked to any other nucleotides, at least not at this end right here. They just don't have that, that hydroxyl group. Um, and uh, the other modification for these di dideoxynucleotides is this. They attach different color pigments to the base right here. In other words, just instead of just being a plain old G, A, or T, or C, they might have blue colored Gs, red colored As, green colored Ts, and yellow colored Cs, whereas the standard bases are more or less colorless. So here's our mixture of nucleotides, mostly the standard ones, a few of these dideoxy ones with the color G's and A's and T's and C's. They're all mixed together inside our test tube. And we've got our primed gene, and now we add the DNA polymerase enzyme. Okay, so DNA polymerase enzyme comes along and starts making the complementary strand. What's the first nucleotide it needs right here? Well, what's complementary to T? A. a, right, so it needs an A. So it reaches out for a nucleotide, and enzymes don't have eyeballs, so they're just gonna sort of randomly grab one. And since most of them are these normal nucleotides, it's probably gonna grab just a regular old A, uh, like that. What's the next nucleotide it needs? C, right. And so again, it just sort of waits for the first C to come around, and since it doesn't have eyeballs, it just probably grabs this one right here, C. And then, what's the next one it needs? A T. And so let's say just by chance, it happens to grab one of these pigmented dideoxy ones this time. So it lands a T right there. 
But notice it can't add any more. Why not? Well, there's no three prime hydroxyl there, and you need that three prime hydroxyl to add any more nucleotides. And so the, 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 the chain, the strand has to terminate uh, right there. Uh, the enzyme just gives up because there's no more uh, three prime hydroxyl group to add on that. Well, so what, what did we end up with? We ended up with that. Well, these enzymes can carry out reactions over and over again, and so an, uh, the enzyme will eventually start over again, essentially from scratch. And so same process, it kind of reaches blindly, and let's say it grabs an A, and then it reaches blindly and gets a normal C, and then it reaches blindly and gets a normal T, and then it reaches blindly and gets a normal T, and then it reaches blindly, and let's say it gets one of the colored Gs, like that. Well, that terminates that chain, because it can't add any more, it's one of these dideoxys. And so now we're gonna have a A, C, T, T, G. And that's the end of that chain, but then the enzyme will start all over from scratch, and basically the same process. Maybe it gets that A right, and now maybe it grabs a dideoxy C right there, and so that's the end of that chain. So if you think about it, we're gonna end up with a collection of nucleotides that looks something like this. Uh, and if it terminates right there, we would get A, T, T, T like that. And let's go one more. Uh, we would eventually also get an A, C, T, T, G, G, and let's do one more. You would also end up with an A, C, T, T, G, G, and then if it grabbed a chain terminating C to match up with that G, you'd end up like that. All right, so this, what this process gives you then is a whole collection of strands. They have all got the same sequence, or at least the, they're all complementary to, to the strand you started with here, but there are varying lengths because at different points they grab the chain terminator nucleotide. What you do next is that there's a, there's a sequencing machine you feed these into. They just normally call these sequencers. And the sequencing machine has a chromatography column to start off with. Uh, now remember what chromatography is. Chromatography is a way of separating molecules out from each other based on, well, based on various things. It depends on what type of uh, chromatography column it is. But this type of column separates them by size, sort of like what you did. Remember when you ran the agarose gel, it separates the pieces of DNA by size? Yeah, that's so what these, these, these things do. You feed your collection of nuclear uh, strands in there, and then, and then as they work through, work their way through, the smallest ones can migrate fastest, and the second smallest one's a little slightly slower, and the next one's slightly slower yet. So they, 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 they come out of this machine in their correct order, so to speak. You would get, let's see, what's the biggest one there? A, C, T, T, G, G, C. That would take the slowest and then A, C, T, T, G. G is the next, uh, is slightly faster because it's slightly smaller. Like that. What colors are T's? Oh, I goofed up the colors. G 
Teaser blue. Thank you. Uh, Teaser green. green. Thank you. Glad somebody's paying attention. And Caesar red, like that. Uh, and I guess in theory you might even have an A sitting there. What color is A? Is yellow or something like that? There we go. Anyway, uh, so the, the fragments that you generated come off this column, smallest first, then second smallest, and then slightly larger, slightly larger, slightly larger. And what you do is you have a laser shining here that's capable of detecting the colors. So this, this laser sees a yellow thing go through first, yeah, like that, and the computer says, oh, okay, if I saw a yellow there, that must be an A. And then the next thing that comes through there is red, and the laser sees that and says, aha, that's gotta be C, because I know C's are red. And so it essentially, by reading the colors coming through, it's able to reconstruct the sequence of your original gene, or at least the complement to that 